Hello, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. <clears throat> we have a few announcements as everyone joins. First, we are recording this session and it will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the conference is over. If you'd like to ask our speakers a question during the session, please use the Q&A area to the right of your screen. Also, you may be asked to come on screen and unmute yourself if you'd like. The chat window in Whova is where you can engage with other attendees. And we kindly ask that you keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentations and follow the presenter's lead on when to engage with cameras and microphones on. It looks like we're about ready to get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Seth to begin. Seth? Hi, I'm Seth Bigelow, research consultant in Southwest Georgia. And in my work with Kevin Hires and the Fire Science Lab at Tall Timbers Research Station, I've really come to appreciate the power of environmental physics in addressing uh, questions of fire ecology and management pertaining to fine fuels. And I'm really excited to have been able to convene a panel of expert researchers in this topic. Our first speaker today is Dr. Sarah McAllister of the Missoula Fire Sciences Lab of the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Uh, Sarah, take it away. Okay, uh, hi, thank you. I'm gonna uh, share my screen here and get my presentation up. I'm not great at multitasking, so <laughs> there we go. Um, so today I'm going to start by uh, start off the session by kind of just rambling a little bit about live fuel flammability and why everything we thought we knew was wrong. Um, so I have a couple of co-authors on this work um, that work with me at uh, the Missoula Fire Lab uh, that are uh, listed here. So uh, I'm first going to talk about why we care about live fuels in the first place, right? So there's two really main reasons, right? Prescribed fires uh, often occur in the spring, and they usually involve surface fuels like grasses and small shrubs, which are off, you know, usually green and living in the spring when they uh, prescribed fires occur. Also, they're very important in wildland fires, particularly in crown fires, where the live tree canopies and the shrub canopies burn. And so they're very important for many different uh, aspects of, of management. So how do we actually deal with them now? Well, in our operational models, whether that's Behave Plus, Farsight, FS Pro, WFDIS, IFDIS, anything with an underlying fire behavior model in an operational sense, we all rely on the same set of underlying fire behavior models. So for surface fire spread, that's the Rothmel equation. And uh, just to remind everybody, that's, that's a semi-empirical model that's based on wind tunnel burns. It was meant for steady state spread in the head fire direction, and it was only really developed in homogeneous fuels. And it wasn't until we had that uh, modification by Albini that we were able to do anything with live fuels, which um, I consider sort of a voodoo waiting scheme for fuel loading and moisture of extinction. Uh, one of my colleagues calls it a swag. Um, and in fact, another one of my colleagues, Matt Jolly, in a paper in 2007, showed that the model output um, actually can be very extremely sensitive to the live fuel moisture content, especially with the Scott and Bergen 40 fuel models in the range of moisture contents that are normally encountered, right? So there was a, a grass model that showed a 1200% increase in the spread rate with only a 10% decrease in moisture content, which really isn't you know, realist, realistic, excuse me. Um, for tra transition, we use the Van Wagner model, which is based on a pretty limited set of data. And then for active crown fire spread, we use the Rother mo model from 91, which is a purely empirical correlation based on eight data points from seven fires. Uh, and it's important to know that this really only works for um, wind-driven fire spread and not plume-dominated fire spread. Those, those data didn't fit the correlation, so they were thrown out. Uh, and it really just, um, this model just takes the surface fire rate of spread and multiplies it by some constant to get the crown fire rate of spread. So our research models, there are many of them out there. We've had sessions about this in this conference so far today. They do things differently, right? They're physics-based. Um, and I'm gonna talk very briefly about two of them. And I apologize because I think the people who developed them are in the audience. I saw Ruddy and there's very likely somebody from Los Alamos here who can correct me if I've misinterpreted anything. Um, so uh, fire tech is a coupled atmosphere and wildfire behavior model. It actually solves the conservation equations in two and 3D for gas and solid phases. It includes the water from live fuels as gas in the solid, it, water as gas and in the solid phase equations by treating them like a wet dead fuel. Um, so in the gas phase, it adds water as another species in the gas phase equations, but it doesn't have an effect on the ignition criteria. 
And it also includes water in the solid phase as well in a couple of different places. Uh, in WFDS, um, they, it uses separate yet coupled models for solid and gas phase, also solving the conservation equations. And here combustion is modeled using a mixture fraction approach. Um, and it occurs when the gas, fuel, and air are mixed in the, in the right proportions, uh, regardless of gas temperature. So the solid fuel itself is assumed to be thermally thin, which means that there's no temperature grading. It's a constant temperature throughout. Uh, and it treats the solid fuel as a dry fuel mass plus of water in it. Um, so in other words, if, since it's, it's thermally thin and it's just fuel plus water, that means as the fuel heats up, it, um, it, it heats up to a boiling temperature. So the effect of water is included in the specific heat there. And then the temperature of that fuel remains constant while the water boils. And then once all that water has boiled, it then begins to increase temperature again until ignition. So in other words, how we deal with live fuels um, is that we don't really do anything special with them, right? Uh, in our operational models, we do some kind of voodoo so that we hand wave some effects into them. Um, in, our, in our physically based models, we treat them as thermally thin, wet, dead fuels. So the next question is, is, is that right? Is this a, an accurate way of dealing with live fuels? So the first part of that is to answer the question, are fuels thermally thin, are live fuels thermally thin? And I apologize for equations, I'm an engineer, but um, they're very simple equations. And the idea here is that there's in engineering land, when you're calculating the temperature of a, of a, of a thing, there's two limiting assumptions. Either it is thermally thick, where that internal temperature doesn't change at all while it heats up, or it's thermally thin, where the whole, the whole thing is at the same temperature. And by using those two limiting assumptions, um, we can easily solve for you know, a time to ignition, for example. And so in order to figure out if something is thermally thick or thermally thin, we can do some experiments where we look at the ignition time as a function of that external heat flux. That's that QE double prime here. And if uh, we plot that those data um, in certain ways, we can kind of tease out which one fits better. So I did lodgepool pine and Douglas fir and, um, and as a function of external heat flux and plotted it using these um, engineering axes and saw that live fuels actually um, uh, both fit both assumptions actually reasonably well, which actually implies that the live fuels has some temperature gradient in it, maybe not fully as to the thermally thick assumption, uh, but it's also not purely thermally thin either. Um, so the answer there is not exactly. So the next question is, is, well, do live fuels behave like we would expect wet wood to behave, right? So we know a lot of things about the way wood ignites and burns. It's relatively well studied in their literature. And we know from these research studies that water has several effects. Uh, it can change the thermal properties of the fuel um, by changing the thermal conductivity, the density, and the specific heat, all which sort of slow the heating time down. Uh, and if the uh, block of wood is thermally thick or thermally intermediate, like our live fuels are, we know that there's some temperature gradient in there, which means that there could be water still evaporating while the fuel is ready to ignite, which means that water is evaporating and diluting the pyrolysates, the actual gaseous fuel that ignites and burns, which means that it effectively raises the ignition temperature of that fuel. In fact, there was a paper by Janssen's in 1991 that showed that there was a two degree increase in Celsius in the ignition temperature per moisture content uh, increase. Um, so, um, you know, there's, uh, multiple ways that water can affect how things ignite as in this equation. And if you were to look at, you know, a block of wood with different moisture contents and different heating ranges, we would see that the ignition time um, is really a linear function of the moisture content in a, in a, in a pretty wide um, range of heating, heating rates. So then, it, you know, this would, you know, leads to the question of, well, do live fuels behave the same way? In, does, their, does their ignition time vary in the same way as moisture content does in this very predictable, understandable fashion? So uh, actually, David Weiss and I did some experiments uh, where we actually looked at uh, 10 different live fuel species over the course of an entire year um, and allowed that moisture content to, to naturally vary during the growing season and did some ignition time measurements and saw some very interesting things as this graph would apply. So, you know, uh, certain species like sagebrush and the red here um, did very much have a nice linear relationship with the ignition time and moisture content that you would expect. Uh, and lodgepole pine was kind of somewhere in the middle with a little bit of an, you know, increasing trend. 
but Chamise and Gamble Oak had almost no trend whatsoever in ignition time with moisture content. Uh, a couple other species here, sand pine, again, um, had no trend with moisture content. And manzanita, manzanita and ceanothus um, from Southern California here um, would have had a pretty good trend with um, ignition time, except for these points out here um, to the right of the graph um, that actually were new leaves that had flushed out that had completely broken the trend um, of the, the ignition time and moisture content. And finally, um, Douglas fir actually also had a nice linear trend um, between ignition time and moisture content. And to some extent, so did Federbush and gallberry, but the slope was backwards. These fuels actually ignited faster the wetter they were. Um, so are live fuels thermally thin wet wood? No, <laughs> they are not. We have to be very careful here. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and kind of talk about my musings of why this is. Um, I think there are certain structural reasons why, there are certain chemical reasons why, and I think we really need to ask the question of what moisture content means for a live fuel. So I'm probably preaching to the choir here, and there's a lot of other people out here that know a lot more about these things than I do. I'm an engineer, uh, not an ecologist or a botanist, but um, so there's, a, there's some huge structural differences between wood and a, and a needle and a leaf, right? Wood is mostly xylem, it's dead cells. They're highly, sig highly lignified cell walls. I mean, yes, green wood can have a lot of water in it, um, but not the type of, of lumber that we you know, say build houses out of and actually do our laboratory tests with, right? Um, needles and leaves have so much more going on. They're you know, multiple layers. They have an epidermis um, with stomata that open and close. They've got layers of cutin or wax on the outside of it. The inside of it is our living cells that do all the photosynthesis. There's vascular tissue in there with some xylem and phloem as well, and branches and, like, and veins that go through it. Um, and the majority of them are living cells that only have cellulosic primary uh, cell walls, right? So the way a live fuel in a leaf can store water is very different than the way wood occurs in, or that water occurs in wood. And uh, there are a lot of structural differences between uh, the needles and leaves of different species, right? So evergreen plants can afford to build much tougher epidermis layers to keep the water in. And that's especially important where water is scarce, which guess what? That's where wildfires burn. Um, and it, but it costs more, a lot more to make a leaf watertight. And that may not be worth it if that plant is deciduous, right? So like say larch, for example, may not do that as much as a lodgepole pine. And other plants um, make uh, tougher layers of the outside, the epidermis and around the other vascular tissues by, and or put on um, much thicker, waxier um, cuticles or, around it. Um, those plants are called, I'm gonna call, say it wrong, scleriferous, um, which, are con which is a common trait for both conifers and chaparral species. So these kind of structural things are why I think some species burn on crown fires and others don't. You know, you're not gonna get your green lawn to burn um, but you know you can get a logical pine to burn, and I think structural reasons are uh, uh, some of it. Uh, for example, I'm going to show a video here. Hopefully, this comes through streaming. Okay, so this is a feta bush leaf at a thousand frames per second, being heated with a 800 degrees Celsius airstream, and you can see you know like the waxy stuff is starting to melt. There's some bubbles that form, but you, know, you see that structure of the leaf, right? It's very um, you know the veins going through it, but uh, you know that's how it evaporates water. That is not normal. That's not how wood would evaporate. That's not how your green grass would evaporate water. That is a, a structural difference, right, of, of how a green leaf would evaporate compared to a, a, a chunk of wood or even a dead leaf. Um, so I have another example here. This one is grand fir. Um, so this is a side by side, same thousand frames per second, same 800 degrees Celsius airstream. Um, and uh, so, this is IR on the on the right, visual on the left. Um, the IR, the temperatures on the right aren't aren't correct because we're, we're we don't have the right emissivity. We're just basically looking at density differences here. But um, almost immediately after it's put into the that hot air stream, um, you can see that it starts doing this sort of violent evaporation of water. Right, um, it starts popping. You can see you know chunks of things coming out of this. Right, so I mean it's not it's not just water that's coming out. Right. And um, in a second here, you're gonna see that see right there, that some of the things that's jetting out of the, the live fuel isn't water, they're flammable gases, right? This is something else um, that's happening here. So I'm gonna let this play for just a moment. 
I know I'm a little tight on time, but this one's fun to watch. So just for um, you know, comparison, this is about two seconds worth of real time here. But uh, you can see in the IR that there is an enormous amount of stuff coming off of this live fuel that we can't see visually. So um, it's, it's pretty neat. So the action does, you know, start picking up here in a minute. Um, and we get more jets of flammable vapors and there's some more of it. And this, this kind of continues until the whole thing like fully visually ignites, right? Because if you look at the IR camera, it looks like it's already there. All right, I think I will move on. So there are also chemical differences as well, right? So I mean, those are structural things, but there's some also some chemistry stuff that's going on here, which I'm hoping David Weiss is gonna talk about next. Um, so, you know, wood is nearly 100% what we would call structural carbohydrates. That's cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. It has a lot of lignin in, that, in those cell walls. But live fuels, that's only half the picture, right? They have half of their dry mass as other things than other than structural carbohydrates. Some things like deciduous leaves don't have as much, nearly as much lignin. There's sugars and starches from photosynthesis that are constantly being stored and moved around and generated and you know, metabolized. There's fats, there's proteins. There's also some arguable amounts of volatiles in there that are contributing. And all of these chemical things could then also be you know, changing the actual pyrolysates, the chemistry of the fuel. I mean, we're, we're talking, it could be you know, gasoline versus diesel, right? They're different. Um, and that can affect um, pyrolysis and the ignition temperature and the way things ignite and burn. So finally, moisture content, right? This is, this is another challenge, right? Because we typically identify moisture content as the mass of water divided by the dry mass of the fuel. But a lot of plants have distinct growing seasons and dormant seasons, right? So it's, it's generating sugars and starches, it's storing them, it's using those then to put on leaves as, you know, as the needles and leaves flush from the next year. Um, it's also you, to help storing sugars to help them freeze from the winter. So you know, in live fuels, the, the dry mass itself can change during the growing season quite a bit, or even during the course of a day for that matter. Um, so, you know, because of this dry, the changes in dry mass, the moisture content can change considerably without any change in the amount of water in that live fuel. So I mean, it makes you wonder, you know, are we, is this, is this the right thing to characterize live fuels? So uh, just to wrap up, to summarize, uh, we have to be very careful with how we treat live fuels. They're not in wet wood or wet dead fuels. We need new ways of describing live fuels um, so that their ignition and burning behavior can be predicted and characterized, particularly moisture content, right? We, should we be using relative water content, uh, measuring it on a fresh mass basis some other way? And we need to tease out these structural and chemical differences um, and you know, whether or not these are in fact driving it. It could be something else entirely, I don't know. Um, are, is one of these more important than the other? And finally, we need to be able to use those mechanisms to then predict flammability so that we can actually explain some of these seasonal differences and species differences in flammability that we just kind of hand wave around. So with that, I will answer questions and I have a bunch of references here from all the stuff that I sprinkled throughout the presentation. Thank you. That's one question, and I encourage the audience to just unmute yourself and ask your question directly. I've stunned everyone. I got, I got one. Sarah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that talk. This is Kevin Hires. Um, I was going to type it and then I quit. Um, you know, so you got the split personality of live fuels is thermally thin and thick. Depend, does that kind of depend on the strength of the heat source? I was trying to look at the minutes of the delay and graphics you were showing uh, from the variety of species. Um, what was the sort of the strength of that, uh, of that energy that was used to kind of drive off the, the moisture under those graphics versus the two second ignition of, uh, of the, um, the video you showed, I think, of the, the, the spruce? Um, so that's a very good question. Yes. Um, 
not just live fuels, but all fuels, whether or not you heat them very quickly or very slowly are going to behave differently, right? So all of those graphs I showed of those 10 different live fuel species were all done at 50 kilowatts per meter, per meter squared radiant heat. But you know, this is, this is kind of a whole other topic of discussion. Of, but, so they were clipped, laid flat on a, on a sheet and then heated with a radiant heater. Um, whereas the other ones were stuck in that hot air stream, which had likely a higher heat flux. Um, but you know, you know, in a crown fire, we're looking at really high levels of heat flux. So even 50 kilowatts per meter square is probably the lower end. So we're talking at really high rates of heating. Um, so it's going to behave more and more on that thermally thick side of things, just because it doesn't have time to conduct that heat into the inside. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that was a great talk. I appreciate it. We're going to have to go on to the next uh, speaker. Okay. And, uh, and I'd like to welcome David Wise. And David, if you could share your uh, screen, that would be great. Um, David Wise is a, a scientist at the Fire Lab of the Pacific Southwest Research Station, U.S. Forest Service. Well, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Sarah, actually, um, for, for a, a great introduction. And so what, what I'm going to be talking about for about the next 15 minutes or so is sort of the uh, highlights of about 20 years of work uh, focused on, on live fuels. And it actually is, as I was thinking about it, this started in 2001. So um, let me get the, there we go. Um, so as Sarah pointed out, um, live fuels uh, occur worldwide. They occur in all kinds of shapes and sizes, herbaceous, shrub and tree, foliar and woody. Um, in terms of the processes of, uh, uh, related to ignition um, or fire in live fuels, it's, it's a combination of evaporation, pyrolysis, and combustion, same as you'd expect in dead fuels. Um, there's different kinds of heat transfer which affect uh, affect live fuels, and then as Sarah was talking about here right at the end, uh, the the chemical composition um, of live fuels is somewhat different than than uh, dead fuels, and so these are uh, some of the the things that we've looked at over time. And so I want to show you an early video. Um, that was done. It's similar to the Federbush, except this is Manzanita. And if you look uh, here again, this is being heated in a flat flame burner, which is hot combustion gases. And on the, the left, you can see the bubbles forming as the, the cuticle, the waxy cuticle probably is melting. And I don't know if you caught it in the uh, right hand one, but at least Manzanita is one of those species like uh, the fetter bush that Sarah showed, uh, where you actually, uh, the leaves actually burst. And um, so this was some very early work we did. And with the question, are live fuels different than dead fuels? And so it was a uh, very qualitative work. Here you see a chemise needle, uh, probably looks like the uh, grand fur that Sarah had, same apparatus uh, used here. Uh, flat flame burner, so just hot post-combustion gases, and you get similar behavior uh, that you see in the uh, grand fur. Uh, we don't have the advantage of having the uh, the IR showing all of the uh, outgassing uh, and pyrolysis uh, and evaporation occurring. So some of the early work that we we did, we were looking, and Sarah talked about this. Um, as well, we were looking at how important is moisture uh, in live fuels. And what we have here are two different graphs, same experiment, but uh, the, the species are sort of split. The southern part is uh, interior west fuels. And then the upper graph is uh, live fuels from both the Southern California as well as uh, the Southeastern US. And what we're looking at here is the mass of water uh, contained in the leaf and the mass that's been released at ignition um, on the y-axis. And so what, you, what this essentially was showing was that 
at the time of ignition of these single leaf samples, um, there was still quite a bit of moisture contained in that. Um, moving on, uh, Sarah also talked about the, the role of moisture in pyrolysis. And what this is showing, this is purely a numerical experiment where we varied the percentage of water in a flammable gas mixture uh, just using an opposed flow diffuse flame model. And what it boils down to is what this graph is showing is that as the, the moisture content uh, or the moisture fraction uh, in that mixture, as it increases, the actual temperature of the mixture decreases markedly. Uh, the solid line at the top is basically no moisture, whereas the uh, large dot dash curve at the bottom, water makes up 60% of the mixture. And you can see that's quite a dramatic difference in temperature uh, of the mixture. Um, well, moving on in terms of how modeling or how we model moisture, and at least in the physical models, um, there's a variety of reaction schemes, which we can see here. Um, and typically, the Arrhen an Arrhenius approach is used to model pyrolysis and ignition. So what we have here is a combination or a comparison between experimental data represented by the, the dashed line and the confidence intervals with Arrhenius modeling of uh, the, in this case, this is the mass change over time for a variety of uh, moisture contents up to 63%, and that's on a dry weight basis. And as you can see, the Arrhenius model doesn't work particularly well um, in comparison to uh, the data that were collected. And we attributed this work primarily to differences in the solid model. And changing the model um, to, for moisture uh, to an equilibrium model, um, we see that in the equilibrium model here uh, is, is the solid line. The Arrhenius model is the uh, dashed line, which the Arrhenius model tends to smooth things out. And uh, the, we found that the equilibrium model um, has a much sounder physical basis. Um, and in terms of, there are, we have other graphs that compare uh, the actual data, but uh, the upshot of this particular study was that using the, an equilibrium type of model uh, to model uh, evaporation and moisture loss from uh, simulated live fuels uh, is the preferred, uh, is a better model. Um, looking at the effects of different types of heating, in this case, radiant being um, the red line, uh, and convective being the sort of teal blue and convection and radiation together um, for the, in this case, this is the same species uh, looked at in May and looked at in September. And what we find is that with, at least with our samples, that the, this radiant flux of 50 kilowatts per square meter was not sufficient uh, to cause ignition. It dried the leaves out quite well, but we did not get ignition. Um, but with the convective heating, which in this case was hot, hot gases, um, just not, not hot air, but they were hot post-combustion gases, uh, we did get um, an ignition and a much faster heating. And there were differences between a season as well as species. So we're talking about ignition. It actually, that occurs after py pyrolysis or the, the solid uh, breakdown or solid decomposition into gases. And so what I'm showing here is some unpublished data using FTIR to identify the gases um, from a, a study with uh, colleagues at PNNL. And what I've presented here is the geometric mean, which is actually the appropriate mean to use, as well as the geometric standard deviation. And as you can see, this is a composition of gas measured um, during pyrolysis. Uh, in a wind tunnel experiment we completed a couple of years ago. Um, you can see that water, uh, which the FTIR is able to measure and other sampling, gas sampling equipment that we've used uh, 
doesn't pick up because we remove the water from the samples. Um, water was a large component of that mixture. Um, and I'm gonna go up here. If you wanted to try to put a confidence interval around uh, these concentrations, um, the formula there at the bottom um, is the, the confidence interval you would use for a geometric mean and the standard deviation. Using this approach guarantees that your confidence intervals don't go below zero because that makes no physical sense. Well, moving along, uh, we did a series, also have done a series of experiments burning 100% live fuel beds. Um, in this case, it's foliage and branches. Um, in this case, I believe this is probably Ceanothus. Uh, high bulk density uh, fuel beds, much denser than you'd expect to find in the field, probably more like a, a litter fuel bed, but 100% green. And we found that wind and slope were two very important factors and not very much uh, was required of either one to get a fire to spread uh, through a fuel bed where it wouldn't spread um, if neither of those factors were present. And moisture in this case seemed to affect the slope, the critical slope at which we could get propagation. Now this isn't a fire that you're going to have difficulty uh, escaping from, but suffice it to say that uh, it, it, wind and slope are important. And so what you see here are two uh, large eddy simulations uh, of an old model, probably at this point, 15, 20 years old uh, of those two settings. Uh, the life, the no wind situation did not spread, um, but what we have here, the rectangle represents an elevated fuel bed, which you would expect in a shrub canopy because you have a gap uh, between the ground and where the foliage is. And so you have air movement through that. But what this was showing, at least with this model, we were able to uh, get the model to spread and to, to match the, the observed rates of spread fairly well. And, and in these models, we were rep modeling radiation, convective heating, convective cooling, uh, radiative loss, and what have you. Uh, continuing on the, the heat transfer effects on live fuels, we've done a study uh, where we were looking at the effects of heat transfer mode, moisture content, plants and plant species, how those affect the composition of pyrolysis gases uh, that we could measure. Um, we've analyzed this using a technique appropriate for compositional data, um, which recognizes that these data are multivariate and they're actually relative. They're not absolute numbers. And what we found uh, was that all three of these factors um, affected the composition of the pyrolysis gases. And uh, this is, I apologize for this, but there were lots of comparisons here. But what we're looking at uh, on the left-hand side are various ratios of gases. In the case of TARs versus permanent gases, which are CO, CO2, uh, hydrogen, and, and uh, methane. Um, and then across the top, uh, the first ones are different heating methods. Slow in this case is what you'd expect out of a TGA, which is often used to provide us with the information we need um, to model uh, combustion and fuels. And radiation convection, radiation and convection combined. Um, and then lastly, on the far right, it's uh, fresh, uh, foliage versus dry foliage. And as you can see, the, the so this is just a, a pairwise comparison. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference uh, in the various ratios of the, uh, um, between the ratios of these groups of gases, uh, which were produced by pyrolysis um, as well. And so they're affected by the heating mode, whether it's hot or dry or, fresh foliage. Um, and in this case, this was air dried foliage, not subjected to heating. So it's quite complex. Uh, what was one thing though, in this case, a lot of the mixtures, gas mixtures or gas ratios of the gases that we measured 
were not affected by whether the foliage was air dried or fresh. So as, as I was saying, we've done, looked at several different models um, to model live fuels, LES and RANS uh, related to modeling those fuel beds. Uh, Pat Bagney at Berkeley developed a model at the same time the Rothermel model was published. Um, his was a physically, more physically based model. Um, we've used FireTech. Um, as Sarah mentioned, the Rothermel was not structured really to look at live fuels, uh, pure, pure live fuel beds. Um, we've been modeling using a, a generalized pyrolysis model coupled with FDS uh, to look at the effects of evaporation, decomposition, and ignition. Uh, we have not modeled seasonal changes yet. Um, a lot of this work has resulted uh, in Mark Dietenberger at the Force Products Lab, creating a new module to model the temperature, um, or not the temperature, but the uh, vegetation, uh, vegetation model, uh, taking into account all of the chemical work, um, which, which Mark and uh, his colleagues at FPL have performed looking at detailed chemistry of several live fuels. Um, upshot of all of this, with the exception of the Rothermel model and the Pagni model, uh, these things are very computationally uh, demanding to try to model the uh, subtleties of, of live fuel. So in summary, um, what we've done over the 20 years is we've improved the understanding and physical modeling of live fuel pyrolysis and ignition. Um, physical models uh, of, of various types produce better results, but as several folks have talked about in other sessions, there is a trade-off of the complexity versus uh, the computation time. Um, there's about 11 dissertations, maybe one or two more, uh, that really get into the details of all of this work. Um, some 40 journal articles, most of which are available uh, at the uh, Forest Services Tree Search website. And uh, if you want to find out more about that, I'd be more than happy to provide links to any of those. And lastly, uh, all of this work, like I said, 20 years and several million dollars over the years has been funded by Forest Service R&D, the National Fire Plan when we had it, the Fire Science Program, the CERTIP Program, and lots of key cooperators at UC Riverside, UC Berkeley, Brigham Young, University of Alabama in Huntsville, and in two national labs at Los Alamos uh, and the Pacific Northwest National Lab. And I apologize for a whirlwind, but if, if you want more information, here's uh, our contact information. I would say these are probably the principal folks, uh, at least in recent years, that have been involved uh, with producing all of this good information. And I believe there's probably a couple of minutes for questions, uh, which I can attempt to answer. Thank you. And I would encourage anyone with a question to go ahead and unmute your mic and just uh, jump right in. Phasers must have been on stun. <laughs> well, as my ninth grade science teacher told me, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. So come on, audience. We've got one minute left for a question. I think everybody took a coffee break or something. <laughs> okay, well, David, thank you very much for sharing the results of that remarkable body of work of yours. I appreciate it.
we'll go on to our next speaker now, uh, who is Dr. Jesse Cry of the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management at Penn State. Jesse, take it away. All right, I think we're all set in the driver's seat at this point. Great, um, <clears throat> thank you, Seth. Uh, I really appreciate your invite for this special session. Um, it's exciting to see that you know, there's a lot of folks doing work, looking at the more nuances and variability of fine fuels, both in terms of fire behavior and in moisture dynamics, rather than just you know the way we've simply looked at them, particularly in the modeling realm, um, in, in such a simplified way. So it's really exciting to see there's a lot more work being done on that because I've been doing some work with fine fuels uh, essentially for the last uh, 15 or more years. Um, and so I'm happy to be able to present some of the stuff that I've been doing with <clears throat> colleagues Jeff Kane and, and Morgan Varner here in this talk. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any really fancy and really cool videos in this talk, but I do have some scatter plots um, that I'll be showing you. But for this research, I'll be focusing on dead fuels. Okay, so focusing on leaf litter of various tree species in the east. I'll be talking about some of our research both in the southeast and the northeast to try and get at some of the variability across species, both in terms of flammability and in moisture dynamics. Uh, so we're focusing on just dead litter here in, in this particular talk. And again, I'll be presenting um, some work going back about 15 years that um, Jeff and Morgan and myself has, uh, have been doing and, and kind of tackling um, this issue. I think what, <clears throat> what really drove um, our interest in work in this work was not necessarily from the modeling standpoint, modeling fire behavior, which a lot of our fire work has been um, driven by over the last you know, several decades, but really the ecological component of, of potential variability and flammability across species. And I think kind of go back to this you know, hypothesis that Bob Much published in 1970 in Ecology, he was essentially suggesting that you know, fire dependent species or plant species that can persist in fire prone environments may actually have inherent flammable characteristics that allow them to perpetuate in these fire dependent systems. I mean, kind of creating a, a feedback loop, if you will, to maintain their presence in, in systems that burn very well. So that's really the premise for this. And, and the cool thing is, is you know, I'm going to be presenting uh, data from uh, a few different studies, um, and, and we're only focusing on the East. Morgan and Jeff, you know, they've been doing a lot of flammability work across all of North America and really cataloging a database of flammability. And what's really helpful is all of this work has been done at the Humboldt State Lab, uh, where Jeff is using the same methods every time, no matter where we're collecting these um, fuels from. So it allows us to really collect a larger database and be able to kind of make some comparisons across species, given we have that ability to continue to, to burn in the same lab under the same conditions. And, and that's really exciting. So <clears throat> back in, in 2008, <clears throat> uh, Jeff and I were both working with Morgan. We were his first two graduate students. Um, and <clears throat> Jeff was, I think, thinking about this, you know, the ecological context of flammability. And he looked at flammability across different oak species in the Southeast. And he did this using uh, methods that Rich Fonda, who's from Western Washington, had conducted looking at flammability across different pine species in the West. Okay? So burning 15 grams of dry litter um, by species in a lab, and then measuring um, various flammability characteristics, um, including flame height, flame time, smoldering time, and consumption, um, which are rather simplistic measures, but it's really interesting when we use these measures to see how species actually uh, cluster out. And given the fact we would expect many of these flammability metrics to be correlated, um, we've used a multivariate approach, usually principal components analysis to pull these flammability metrics together into some kind of flammable or flammability index, if you will, based on the PCA factors to help us look at how um, variable flammability is across species. What Jeff showed in, in this particular work was, was really cool. He, he burned eight different 
um, oak species litter from the southeast. And he showed clearly a distinct clustering of two groups that, that he called fire impeders. Okay, those species litter burn very poorly. Fire didn't really burn very well in those um, litter beds. And then fire facilitators, uh, litter that burn very well. And the interesting thing is they clustered out very nicely with four species as impeders and four species as facilitators. And from an ecological standpoint, it's made a lot of sense to us in the way that we a priori think about how these species fit within their you know, pyro environment, if you will, in the southeastern coastal plain. So the fire facilitators that burn very well were like uh, turkey oak and southern red oak that we know can persist in really frequently burned systems, for example, within longleaf pine ecosystems in the southeast. Or those that burn poorly, these fire impeders, or those species that we understand in priori to be fire sensitive um, and that we often implicate in invading these formerly frequently burned systems under decades of fire exclusion, such as Darlington Oak um, and um, Water Oak and Live Oak, such as that. So this was really interesting um, work showing just even within this one genus and one region that there was variability that seemed to align with the ecological context from a, from a fire standpoint. Now that same year, uh, Mark Abrams, who's you know, here at Penn State, one of his grad students, Greg Nowacki, published an important paper um, hypothesizing this idea of, of the loss of fire in the Eastern United States and this me mesification effect. That essentially with decades of fire exclusion, even in the East, um, even up where, where I'm at, that results were creating more of a potentially an alternative stable state where fire sensitive tree species that are more mesic, such as red maple and sugar maple, invade into these formerly more open oak and pied one lids that would have burned more regularly under long-term fire suppression and essentially close the canopy and create more moist shaded conditions on the forest floor that are essentially more mesic and more conducive for these fire sensitive mesic species to be able to perpetuate, kind of creating an alternative stable state. And part of that hypothesis is, is in addition to the structural changes, speculating that shading of the forest floor um, due to canopy closure and the, the invasion, if you will, of these fire sensitive species. They also speculated that the litter differences may have an impact on this mesification project, um, process. Uh, for example, they suggested that, that um, litter from species such as red maple and sugar maple would likely retain more moisture and be um, more difficult to burn, potentially you know, making it uh, more of a challenge for a fire as, a, as an ecological process uh, to be able to do its thing. Okay, so it's, it's really, really interesting work hypothesizing this whole process. And so I followed up with some of that and did some laboratory um, work um, looking at moisture dynamics and litter of southeastern species across the suite of about 17 species, trying to get at the, the mechanism of, of this, is, is it possible? And so what I have in this graph on the right, um, we soaked up these litter beds and allowed them to dry. And on, on the bottom axis, you have initial moisture content. So that's how much moisture these litter beds soaked up. And then on the vertical axis, you have drying time, which is just our time lag concept, right? Uh, and we're you know, considering these as, as being you know, fine fuels. And you see the time lag ranges here from zero to 12 hours. And we found very um, interesting clustering of our species in this regard too, okay? So on the lower left, we have species that have the lowest moisture retention. They don't soak up more, much moisture and they dry very rapidly. And here we have, not surprisingly, um, two of the pines, longleaf pine and um, loblolly pine in the Southeast. But we also see those oaks, those um, fire facilitating oaks that Jeff had shown are very flammable fitting in this cluster of, of species that can shed moisture very, very rapidly. Um, or if you go up you know, vertically in this graph, you also start to see some of those fire impeding oak species that they may be taking on as much moisture, but they're slower to respond in, in, in uh, shedding that moisture, okay? So we're seeing these differences that are, that are interesting in the context of some of the work that Jeff did with flammability of these oaks. And as you go further up and to the right in this graph, we have species that are soaking up a lot more water. 
and are a lot slower to shed that water under drying condition. Okay, so here we have um, beech and tulip poplar, you know, are soaking up a lot more moisture. And then across um, these 17 species, red maple was, was the one that took on the most moisture and was the slowest to dry. So adding some evidence to this idea of red maple potentially being a, um, a mesic species that might be playing a role in dampening fire behavior um, in these for, formerly fire prone ecosystems. Okay, so that, that part was really cool. And so we were starting to get a handle on differences in flammability, starting to look at differences in moisture dynamics. But we know, or we, you know, we would speculate that they're playing a role together. That moisture dynamics is ultimately going to play a role in flammability over time. As you have daily drying, um, that that's going to matter. Uh, we did some work um, with some litter collected in Mississippi um, in some um, oak hickory sites that had, had been fire excluded for a long time. And what we did is we started to incorporate litter from what we a prior would suspect as mesophytic species into more pyrophytic oak litter to look at the impact that it had on flammability. So in this case, our mesophytes uh, were sweet gum, winged elm, and uh, dogwood. And we, we incorporated, a, a, you know, on the x-axis, you see an increasing proportion of those mesophytic species litter into a suite of pyrophytic oaks. Um, white oak, scarlet oak, southern red, and, and post oak, and also some mocker nut hickory. And we see a clear impact as we increase the proportion of mesophytic litter, there's a dampening effect on fire behavior. And what's really important in this graph is we're also showing the impact of moisture dynamics across um, these litter beds as well. Okay, so what we did is we, draw, we soaked these litter beds up and then allowed them to dry and then burn them at 12 hours, and then 24 hours, and then an equilibrium moisture content. And what you see here with the open circles is after 12 hours of drying, you have a really exacerbated effect that the mesophytic species litter is having on dampening fire behavior because they're slowing the drying process. So thinking about that in the context of when fine fuels become available in any given day is, is really important. And so uh, more recently, um, you know, I've been at Penn State uh, for about uh, three years now. We wanted to start to look at flammability across kind of a suite of species up in this neck of the woods, um, if you will. So we collected a lot of, of, of litter here in central Pennsylvania, um, the five different oaks, white oak, northern red, um, chestnut, black oak, and scarlet oak, um, four of our dominant pines, shortleaf pitch, Virginia and eastern white pine. I really wish we had red pine in this data set. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, three of our hickories, pignut, shagbark, and mockernut, and then red maple, sugar maple, and then yellow birch, basswood, and black oak. And if you think about this list of species, you might be already trying to fit these into what you might consider being pyrophytic versus mesophytic species. You know, a lot of folks would think, well, the oaks are likely pyrophytic, many of the pines potentially, you know, the hickories, you know, there could be some debate in there. Uh, but we often think of the maples, uh, yellow birch and basswood as, as being more mesophytic. Black gum, I'm sure we could get in heated debates over what's going on with black gum. So we conducted the same experiments, um, you know, the same flammability experiments with this suite of species. And so what I've done here, okay, so this is, you know, measuring those same flammable characteristics. We did all this burning in, in Jeff's lab out in Humboldt, same methods. So you have this flammability index on the left that essentially is, is more flammable on the top, less flammable on the bottom, okay? And what I've done here is I've ordered the species from lowest flammability to highest flammability. And here we can just see how the species as well as some of the genre really um, kind of cluster out across this flammability gradient, which, which I think is, is pretty interesting. On the low end, okay, so on the left, we have our four pines, and they were the least flammable amongst all of these species that we burn, okay, which may be counterintuitive to some folks who think about the role that fire plays in many pine ecosystems. But if you look at these species, many of them, uh, particularly shortly Virginia and white pine, they're fairly short needled. Um, if you think about them as a, as a litter bed, um, and consider how they might burn. Uh, it might not be surprising um, given the nature of, of the um, structure of, of the needles that, that these might be lower in flammability. I really wish we had red pine in this, in this data set. It'd be interesting to see where it fleshed out. But we do see differences among the four pines too. Okay, pitch pine's more flammable than, 
you know, particularly white and Virginia pine, as well as shortleaf pine, which is interesting. We know the role that fire plays in, in pitch pine ecosystems. And white pine, you know, white pine is not surprising to me, it's the lowest flammable species amongst these. You know, white pine, for me, I think about it as kind of the Douglas fir of the east. You know, it's, it's fire sensitive when it's younger, as it gets bigger um, and puts on uh, accumulations of bark, uh, can become more fire tolerant. But as we move from left to right and we increase in flammability, we, we start to see, you know, this species in the center, largely what I think we would a priori assume to be more mesophytic. Okay, you have you know, basswood and, you know, pignut hickory, we show there's some variability amongst the, the hickories too, um, but birch, red maple, black oven, and sugar maple. So they're kind of in between across this, across this gradient. And then the more flammable species were mockernut and shagbark hickory, and then all of the oaks are clustered at the very top. So all of the five oaks were the most flammable across all of these species that were burned. So we see some clear differences that I think align with kind of our a prior understanding of where we might fit these species in these fire prone landscapes and what's going on, you know, and then the context of, of mesification. You know, one of the things, you know, there's obviously got to be mechanisms that are driving some of this. And, and we've looked at that in some of our other work um, and some of the work that Morgan's done out west with like Eamon Engbar uh, looking at California oaks. You know, you look at a lot of the leaf characteristics of what's driving some of the uh, flammability differences. Here, I just simply graphed um, flammability across fuel bed depth. OK, so all of these burns are conducted with 15 grams a litter. OK, so mass is, is um, you know, constant. But the fuel bed depth is going to vary based on, you know, how large the leaves are, how much they curl. And we find that that's likely, a, you know, plays a significant role in, in, the, in the mechanisms behind uh, driving some of this uh, flammability differences. Okay, I just simply threw in a polynomial curve. I don't know if this is most appropriate, but if you think about, you know, the idea of the optimum packing ratio, you know, you know, going back to just Rothermel's work, you know, maybe that, that seems to be a potential fit. But we clearly see that there's an impact of the fuel bed depth and flammability. We also did moisture dynamics. Okay, so here I'm showing time lag. We calculated the time lag across all these species. And if I keep the, the order of the species on the bottom uh, the same as before, where it's going from the lowest flammability on the left to the highest flammability on the right, we see that the pattern's different. Okay, so interestingly, here the pines are the fastest drawing amongst the species, even though they were the lowest flammable. Um, inflammability. Okay. But if you move up, you know, you see there may be some more of a pattern where the more flammable species, the oaks are also some of the fastest drying amongst the, amongst all of these species in this data set. Whereas those middle species that we would a priori consider as being mesophytic do tend to be slower in their drying response. Um, when we soak them up, which, which makes sense. So across all of these species, the fastest drying species are the four pines. Okay, thanks Seth. And then white oak. Okay, white oak was the fastest drying of, of all of our species at this time point. An easier way to look at this, um, I've graphed here initial moisture content on the, on the vertical. So that's how much moisture they've soaked up. And then their time lag on the, on the X axis. So again, the lower left, you have really low moisture retention, they shed water readily on the upper right, high moisture retention, they can soak up a lot of water and, and retain it. And you can see that clearly the cluster, uh, pines are clustering on the lower left, uh, shedding most moisture. Next you have, you know, the oaks um, in terms of their moisture dynamics. And then above that you have a mix of what we would consider many of the mesophytic species that are taking on more moisture and are, and are slower, slower to dry, which, which makes a prairie sense to us. And, and lastly, you know, we wanted to actually look at this interactive effect of moisture on flammability because we think this is a key aspect. So we took five important species, white oak, chestnut oak, northern red oak, and then our two maples, red and sugar maple, and then soaked them up and again, burn those at different drying times. And we see here that as you go through drying time, okay, from, you know, being wetter to drier, clearly, you know, flaming, flam, flame heights go up, but the impact, the differences between white oak and red maple is red maples drastically exacerbated through the drying process. After 16 hours of drying, red maple is burning very, very poorly and white oak is burning really poorly, okay? So just quick conclusions, um, flammability and moisture dynamics vary among species. The role of moisture dynamics within this um, you know, process is probably really important.
and we have more further work that we need to do. And I'd like to close in case there is a, a question at the end, Seth. Hey, we have time for one quick question. And if you would care to unmute your mic and ask a question, uh, please go right ahead. Seth, it also looks like there's a question in Whova. Uh, I can't see that. Could you ask that? Oh, absolutely. Do you think the fast drying quality of pine leaves is just inherent because of psychological difference, physiological differences between, I'm not going to say these words correctly, <laughs> uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms, or is there a potential benefit to pines in terms of litter flammability? That's from Catherine Fuller. Okay, Catherine, I, I think I get your question there. So do it. You know, the one, the interesting thing is, is the pines dried really fast, but they, they burn poorly compared to the other. Clearly there's physiological differences, but needles, we've done some of this work earlier too, that needles are very different than a flat leaf too, in, in the way they drive moisture dynamics, even flammability. When we look at how they span across flammability with fuel bed depth, fuel bed depth seems to be very important. The pine litter is laying very, very flat, makes it more sub subdued and how well that it burns, we think. But since those needles are really thin, um, we feel that they shed a lot of moisture. They also often have a lot of waxes on them, even after they've you know, fallen um, and been on the ground for a while. So, and, and clearly a physiological difference is very different between gymnosperms and angiosperms as well. So okay. I don't know if that answers your to, question. But. We're gonna have to uh, cut it there. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse, for a great talk. And now we'll go on to Dr. Jeff Kane of the Department of Forestry and Wildland Resources at Humboldt State University. And Jeff, it's loading up. Okay, great, take it away. All right, thank you, Seth. And uh, thank you, Jesse, for, uh, for saying my name so many times in your talk. Uh, I owe you some, some beers. I'm excited about those new, new results. Uh, I'm gonna change pace uh, from flammability and talk about um, microclimate and fuel moisture in a northwestern California oak woodland and um, the effects of stand conditions on these factors. So uh, I don't really have to convince many of you that, you know, dead fuel moisture is important for fire behavior and effects, um, but we also know that they can be very highly variable across space and time, and they can be diff difficult to incorporate into models given that high variation. And then um, what, one of the factors that is contributing to that variation is variability in the stand structures of forest, how dense the forest is. Uh, and there has been previous work that shows that stand structure influences fuel moisture Although in Western US uh, studies that have examined things like uh, the effect of thinning um, forests on surface fuel moisture, dead fuel moisture has been mixed. And in most cases in the Western US, more arid climates, there hasn't been a significant difference between unthinned forest and thin forest in fuel moisture. And that's depicted here briefly with one study by um, Becky Estes and others in uh, interior Northern California. So one possibility of why like the literature is somewhat disparate in its um, in explaining this role of stand conditions on fuel mo dead fuel moisture is because uh, it might be due to the climate. So in more arid climates, we might expect less of a role of sand conditions, but in in more humid climates, we might expect uh, a higher role of, of stand conditions on fuel moisture. So uh, what we did is, is looked at, or, um, you looked at uh, an Oregon white oak woodland or historically white oak woodland. You can see here in this image from uh, the Bald Hills of Redwood National Park in Northwestern California. This is, you know, we have the open prairies we have oak woodlands, and then you can almost see this really intensive ring of Douglas fir encroachment all around that kind of ecotone of, um, of the prairie and woodlands. And then here is another picture where you can see Douglas fir encroaching 
uh, on, on the prairie and oak woodlands here. So uh, this provides a really good uh, system to examine the role of stand conditions because there's a natural gradient of, of conditions of stand density and composition within these systems. And then, uh, and that's largely due to fire exclusion. And then there's also just the ecological importance of these uh, ecosystems. Uh, there's estimated loss of Oregon white oak woodlands and prairies of about 30% within Redwood National Park. And this is something that has occurred throughout the range of these ecosystems. And then uh, the associated loss of, of biodiversity associated with that change in conditions. Um, but as uh, Eamon Engbird has shown that that transition also results in a, an alteration of fuel structure and moisture and in these systems. So another thing is that, you know, in these systems, there's, there's a, a lot of interest and activity in restoring them through the use of prescribed fire uh, to maintain and improve these oak woodlands. However, um, prescribed fire by itself can be pretty low in its effectiveness in killing even small Douglas fir. And so uh, why, why is that? And, um, and oftentimes they need to result, rely on other methods like girdling and thinning to alter the structure enough to promote uh, the fire uh, in these areas and help restoration efforts. So in order to do the, this type of work, we do need to understand what, you know, what is the fuel moisture of these different conditions uh, so that you can better meet management objectives. And just purely relying on existing estimates of fuel moisture from uh, remotely automated weather stations and, or, or fuel moisture calculations, predictions, um, may not be as useful uh, for prescribed fire scenarios. So here, uh, our objectives for the, or this study um, was to examine dead surface fuel moisture uh, and, and examine the patterns over, over a season. Um, they're over from the spring to the fall, essentially, and uh, also to examine the microclimate. So examine the microclimate, seasonal microclimate, seasonal fuel moisture uh, across different stand conditions. In this case, we used intact oak woodlands that were unencroached, encroached, heavily encroached um, oak woodlands, and then uh, areas that were previously heavily encroached that had been thinned. So those are our three stand conditions. And, um, and basically what we expected is that in the intact and thin stands, we would have higher temperature, lower uh, relative humidity, and lower surface fuel moisture relative to um, an encroached oak woodland where we would have lower temperature, higher relative humidity, and higher moisture content in these fuels. And then lastly, we compared our fuel moisture estimates with either you know, instrument uh, monitoring observations or predictions uh, based on um, climactic values. So uh, we did this study near Neeland, California, Northwestern California, uh, Humboldt Redwood Company lands. And we, you know, it's predominantly Oregon white oak. There's some California black oak. And then Douglas fir is the predominant conifer. As I mentioned, we had three stand conditions, intact woodlands, which had almost no Douglas fir, maybe a few seedlings in the understory a heavily encroached uh, oak woodland, encroached by Douglas fir, and the Douglas fir were, were overtopping many of the oaks in these stands. And then uh, areas that had been thinned um, one year previous prior to observations. Uh, for each of these stand conditions, we established three, three plots. Um, and then we collected uh, fuel moisture data every two to four weeks. Uh, from May to October in 2018. And in this case, we looked at um, 
one in 10 hour fuel moistures by species. So if, if they were present, so oak and Douglas fir, litter fermentation layer, the human humus layer, herbaceous was only really present in the intact stands. And then um, I had foliage on there, but that was part of a, a different study that I'm not gonna present on there on today. So we also examined the micrometeorology uh, of these sands. We used uh, standard Kestrel devices, you know, positioned, you know, just about 20, 30 uh, centimeters off the ground. We measured temperature, RH, wind speed, and um, calculated vapor pressure deficit. And then we got um, Neelan data, uh, or sorry, Ross data from Neelan site to get 10 hour fuel moisture um, monitoring data. And then, as I mentioned, we, we predicted um, fuel moisture based on the NFDRS calculations using Fire Family Plus. And then here is just the data for the raw station for temperature, RH, and then the precipitation. So what did we find out? Let me move this. Um, here is the, the, the microclimate data. So for encroached stands, intact stands, and thin stands, this is the hourly data for, for temperature, RH, vapor pressure deficit, and then wind speed. And just some course general, you know, as we move from encroached to thinned, you know, we had higher temperatures, lower RHs, higher vapor pressure deficit. And then wind speed was a little odd. The intact stands oddly had less lower wind speeds than the thinned and encroached stands. And I'm not quite sure exactly why that is. Um, but when we when we modeled this data using a a uh, linear mixed effect model, you know, sure enough, time and condition were important in in each of these measures. And um, and in the case of temperature, there was an interaction of, of time uh, and condition. So since that's hourly data, here is just kind of the mean data to show you. Uh, again, encroached had the coolest um, conditions, thin stands had the warmest conditions, and then this dashed line is, is what the RAWS data uh, had shown. And the Ross, I should mention the Ross was fairly close uh, to this site. It was about a kilometer away. And then again, uh, relative humidity, greatest in the encroached, lowest in the thinned, and then vapor pressure deficit was greatest in the, in the thinned. And the wind speed uh, was generally much lower than, than was observed in the Ross, at the Ross station across all three stands. And um, again, oddly, the intact stand had the lowest wind speed, maximum wind speed. So when we look at um, the actual basal area of these um, different stand conditions, we see you know, some nice relationships as basal area increases, um, temperature decreases, you know, and then as the basal area increases, relative humidity increases, vapor pressure de deficit decreases, and then um, not really a relationship with, with um, wind speed. So uh, would, moving to the fuel moisture, again here, just to explain this figure, we have moisture content on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and then here's Douglas fir litter, one hour, 10 hour fuels, oak, litter, one hour, 10 hour fuels, fermentation layer, and then the humus layer, and then grass was only present in the intact stand. And so um, expectedly, you know, fuel moisture followed seasonal patterns of temperature and precipitation, but we didn't find an effect of species. So Douglas fir didn't, wasn't different than oak, and that was somewhat surprising given there are differences in the fuel bed characteristics of, of litter, much denser in Douglas fir than in oak. And then for fine fuels, uh, encroached stands had 57% higher moisture content 
than thin stands, um, with the largest differences being in the spring and the fall. So on the edges, you know, basically in the prescribed fire season windows. Uh, for duff and humus uh, moisture, they're, you know, one and 1.2 times um, that of the fermentation layer and two times the encro in, in a high encroach stands compared to thin stands. So greater retention of moisture across many different uh, fuel components. And again, these were all um, significant. The role of, of condition was significant um, based on our linear mixed effect models. So when we were looking to compare our observed fuel moisture values at the site to either the raw monitoring data or the predicted um, NFDRS data, uh, we, we did not find a significant relationship. And once you got above 20% um, moisture, there was a really uh, um, breakdown in this one-to-one -one relationship. So here's the observed fuel moisture. Here is the monitored um, fuel moisture at the raw station. And there was no significant relationship there. Uh, and you see the deviation from that one-to-one -one line here um, at higher fuel moisture contents. And there was a, a relationship with the NFDRS uh, predicted fuel moisture, although clearly it was way off of this one-to-one -one line, but that suggests there may be some way to correct that information if there is an established relationship. So just to conclude, uh, stand conditions, you know, clearly had an impact on micrometeorology and that this micro, the, those impacts on micrometeorology had an impact on dead surface fuel moisture patterns. Uh, and then our results contrast with some of the other studies from California, and Arizona that have, that didn't find effect of stand condition on fuel moisture. And this may be, is likely partially due to where we did the study. We did it in Northwestern California, um, not on the coast, but close to the coast. There's still, the site we sampled is influenced by, by fog in the summer. And so that higher humidity is likely um, promoting differences, uh, a higher, a more important role of stand conditions on fuel moisture. And then the reliance on instrumentation or predicted values of fuel moisture alone is likely insufficient um, if, if we want to get accurate levels of moisture content uh, in the um, prescribed burning uh, season, typical prescribed fire seasons. And then, uh, you know, just a call for, for better models that can account for fuel moisture changes um, associated with um, stand conditions. And with that, I'll close out. This study has been published recently in Agriculture and Forest Meteorology. It is open access, so uh, you should be able to get it if you so choose. And just thanking Humboldt Redwood Company and Field Assistance that, uh, that helped out with this project. And with that, I'll be happy to take some, some questions. Thank you, Jeff. I encourage anyone with a question to just unmute their mic and uh, yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, David. And launch it. Uh, yes, thanks for the talk, Jeff. Um, very interesting. Uh, just two, well, one question and one comment. Um, with the NFDRS uh, 10 hour fuel moisture predictions, what did you use to do that? Did you use the 1978 version, the 1988 version. The I, I used it at 78, uh, what's it, Deeming and Cohen um, published equations. Okay, so you might want to consider, uh, if you go further with this, looking at uh, Ralph Nelson's model, which is the newer model specifically towards uh, focused on, on 10 hour fuels. The, the comment though is, uh, I'm not surprised that things work out this way with regard to uh, the more humid environment, because we've seen similar things 
in, in FDRS in Hawaii, and it was a big issue with NFDRS uh, in the Eastern United States, because that's a much more humid environment than, right. than the interior right. West. So there's that older system has got some known limitations. Great, I appreciate that comment and I, I will look into that. Uh, we're gonna have to go on to the next uh, speaker, but thank you thank very you. much, Jeff, for a great talk. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Christina Stodhammer of the Department of Biology of University of Alabama. And uh, Christy, if you could go ahead and share your talk, that would be great. Take it away. See it? I'm assuming you can see it. Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Seth. And um, first of all, I'd just like to say thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, the, my talk today is about a project where we modeled fine dead fuel moisture in a pine flatwoods in the southeastern US. And full disclosure, I'm not a fire ecologist or even an ecologist, I'm a forest biometrician. And so my involvement in this project came about because of some really interesting and thorny modeling issues in analyzing these data. So my colleagues uh, were interested in this project um, because fine dead fuel moisture, as the previous speakers have, have said, is incredibly important for predicting the fire behavior, but our understanding of the fuel moisture is still pretty incomplete. In particular, they were interested in the dynamics driving water exchange um, in terms of increasing our understanding. Um, so fire behavior models, of course, tend to rely on stand level estimates, whereas there happens to be a great deal of variation within the fuel beds. So this study took place in the southeastern US uh, and surface fire regimes are the norm and fine scale fuel properties are the primary driver of fire behavior. So in particular in the system, saw palmetto and pine needles dominate the fuel beds and they're known to have a great deal of variation and they can produce extreme fire behavior. So the end product of our work was a publication that came out at the very end of 2019, and it assessed the complex interactions between these two dominant fuel types, that is saw palmetto and um, uh, pine litter. Um, and the published work had the goal of improving our understanding of the environmental parameters controlling fuel moisture and dead, fine dead fuels. So the effort was to reduce uncertainty in fire behavior models. Today, however, I'm gonna focus on some of the more interesting modeling aspects of the project. So in particular, I want to talk about how we quantified and incorporated lag correlations between fuel moisture content and environmental drivers. So we had two different kinds of fuel moisture content data. We had this so-called continuous data, which is actually half hourly data, um, which is a time series. But we also had periodically sampled data, which and these two different kinds of moisture data required very different methods of analyses. So we had also had two species to observe, of course, and quantifying the differences between those two vegetation types could really allow us to get a better understanding of, of uh, the fuel behavior in, this, in the system. So our study site uh, was at the University of For Florida's Austin Cary Forest. Uh, we were in a 41 hectare pine flatwood stand, which was about three quarters long leaf, one quarter uh, slash. And although the trees varied in age, uh, the tree canopy height was fairly uniform at 22 meters. And the really interesting thing about this system is that it has practically no midstory. Uh, the understory has about 90% cover in saw palmetto and gallberry. And the litter consists about two thirds of pine litter and about one third of saw palmetto. And 25% of that, that litter is in dead biomass that's under the living fronds. So the study took place uh, quite a long time ago from July 2004 to December 2005. So we had a one and a half year period where we were monitoring. So um, the, the study took place uh, at a site where they were doing flux measurements. So we had the benefit of an overstory uh, micrometeorological tower. So we had a whole host of micrometeorological data that we could use for the study. And the really lovely thing was that we also had an understory tower that was identically instrumented with the same exact equipment on it, measuring all those, those variables as well. We also had measurements of soil heat flux, uh, soil vol volumetric water content, 
And also we had measures of fuel moisture and fuel temperature. Um, we had these uh, so-called fuel moisture sticks that were placed randomly within uh, 15 meters of that understory tower. The fuel moisture sample data um, was uh, collected approximately every 10 days, uh, between eight and 14 days apart. Uh, we got five samples of dead saw, saw palmetto and five samples of pine leader randomly selected from, from the footprint of the tower. And these were collected uh, between 10 and three, which are the peak burning times for the area. We assumed that the longleaf and slash pine litter was proportional to the live species. And we should have had a total of 250 samples. Well, we actually did have 250 samples, uh, which were weighed, dried, and uh, reweighed for moisture content. However, we did have some outages. We wanted to tie the data to the micrometeorological data. And we did have, unfortunately, a couple of hurricanes come through the site uh, during uh, July and August of 2005. So we did lose uh, the ability to tie that, that, uh, the sample data to um, the MET data. In the case of the overstory, we only lost six or eight samples, um, but the understory tower had a lot more problems uh, because of the flooding. So we, we were down to about 184 observations for each species for, for that one. Now, <clears throat> um, today I'm talking about, about lag correlation. So, um, we, we were interested in this because we have this continuous, so-called continuous sensor uh, derived fuel moisture content. Um, and that was available over most of the study site, uh, excuse me, study, study period, excluding that outage. Um, and we wanted to investigate the degree to we, which the fuel moisture measurements were correlated to not just the synchronous micromet uh, data, but lagged values of that micromet data. So, thinking about the half hour previous or the day previous temperature or precipitation and so on. So Spearman and Pearson correlation coefficients are, are the sort of the gold standard for measuring synchronous, cor synchronous correlations, but the cross correlation function measures asynchronous correlation. So what you do is you lag the time series by, by one, two, three, and so on um, uh, measurement periods and measure the correlation at how it changes over time. And there are lots of ways to do this. We happen to use SAS that our works just fine. But one thing about using cross correlation functions is, is that these functions are very sensitive to missing data and they are all also require evenly spaced data. The other wrinkle is that if you have autocorrelation in your input series, you have to go through a process called pre whitening. And pre whitening is incredibly important but difficult to do. Uh, so many of our met variables have a really high degree of autocorrelation, that is, self similarity. So for instance, the temperature at nine tends to be very similar to the temperature at 930. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So when the time series uh, of an, an autocorrelated series is cross-correlated to another series, the correlation coefficients will also be influenced by that self-similarity. And that can lead to a false sense of lagged correlations. So we remove the autocorrelation from the input series, for instance, in temperature, uh, to prevent that issue. And in practice, we fit a time series to the input series and also use that uh, as, a, as a filter to, um, for the response variable. And it's called pre-whitening because we essentially make the input series white noise. This can't be done with our sample data though. So our sample data um, that we got from the field are not a time series per se. We have five measurements each time we go out, they're not evenly spaced. We don't measure the same thing over time. Um, so the traditional cross correlation functions are just not there. You just can't use them. Um, <clears throat> the time series methods, um, of course, require these evenly spaced data. So again, uh, something that, that can't be done. Um, <clears throat> so what we did was we computed correlations between our fuel moisture samples and concurrent values of the met variables. We also lagged those met variables. So we uh, made lags from half hours up to 10 days. And then we examined the pattern of correlation over these lag times. Um, now, this doesn't get rid of the self-similarity, but it's as close as we could, could get to, to, uh, to um, getting some idea of the function. So first of all, some, some just some simple results. We can see the fuel moisture content of the pine versus the um, Palmetto is quite different in some months. We see the same sort of overall trend, but then there are some months, particularly in March, where we see some, some vastly different patterns in our, our pine versus our salt palmetto. Um, and of course, we see also in, in the straight black line, we see the fuel moisture sensor, which is 
roughly matching the same pattern uh, as well. So let's look at some results of the cross correlation functions though. So what we did was of course pre-whiten all of the input series. So that would include all of the variables listed on the right side of the slide. And to pre-whiten, we had to use one day and two day autoregressive effects. These are called seasonal effects in time series modeling, but really they're the diurnal um, patterns that we see in these variables. We also used half hourly and hourly coefficients to remove the self-similarity um, uh, at short, short time scales. So what we saw was that the cross correlation functions with the fuel moisture sensors just didn't really have much going on, honestly. Um, if I zoom in uh, to, to the half hour and one hour scales, you can see that yes, there are some variables that do have a blip, that is re relative humidity, air temperature, the vapor pressure deficit of the overstory, the soil temperature of the understory, they all had a significant half hourly lag in correlation with the fuel moisture content, uh, meaning that the stick was more correlated to the half hour previous of those variables than it was to the synchronous value of those variables. Looking at the field moisture uh, content samples, though, by species, again, we, we couldn't pre-whiten, but we didn't see any relationship with, with precipitation when we looked at the sticks, but we saw a very, very interesting relationship that differed by species if we looked at the, if the these two different spa, um, species. So for the pine litter samples, we saw, and I'll zoom in, uh, we saw a big blip in the correlation at four hours and 20 hours. And we saw a much weaker lag uh, for, for saw palmetto, that's in the pink, and it was a um, more of a correlation in about three and a half hours. Looking at the understory, um, we of course can see very clearly some of these diurnal effects that we weren't able to remove. The air temperature and soil heat flux, of course, have this nice 24 hour pattern, not unexpected. Now, so we have to kind of take some of these patterns with a grain of salt, but the thing that I think is interesting in, the, in these, um, these graphs is the difference between the pink and the blue, the, the pine needles in pink, the saw palmetto in blue. So looking at PPFD, for ex example, the peak maximum absolute correlation was lagged by about one hour for the saw palmetto and about eight hours for the pine. If you look at relative humidity and that radiation, you saw much stronger synchronous correlation in saw palmetto versus about four hours for pine. And of course, we have to recognize though that we have this autocorrelation in the series. Um, looking at the overstory, we saw similar but not exactly the same patterns for PPFD as well as net radiation. We saw that the absolute maximum correlation was lagged three to four hours in both of the fuel types. Okay, so if we see this dip in the, in the graph, three to four hours. For relative humidity, we saw a much stronger synchronous correlation for the palmetto versus four hours for the pine. And again, those diurnal patterns are in there. Um, so we have to recognize that, that we need to be cautious about these results. But anyway, but how does this really help us? So uh, whereas the models with synchronous correlation are were, allow us to model the fuel moisture stick. So um, for instance, uh, for example here, we have RH lagged at un, um, of the understory lag by half an hour. We have temperature in the understory lag by half an hour. That, that was the best fitting lowest AIC model to uh, predict the fuel moisture content using that sensor. But for saw palmetto and pine samples, we see a much more complex relationship with these micrometeorological variables. Saw palmetto um, and pine had basically the same group of variables that were important, um, but the lags in particular in cumulative precipitation are quite different. The best model for saw palmetto included a three hour lag in cumulative pre precipitation versus it was more than a day, a 27 and a half lag, hour lag of uh, precip ended up being the best fit model for pine. We also see a much more complicated relationship with relative humidity, three different lags going in there for, for pine versus for saw palmetto, it was synchronous. The relative humidity at the exact time we took that, that sample was very predictive. So what are the appropriate methods and techniques for quantifying cross correlations? Well, if you have so-called continuous data that's nice and evenly spaced, those cross correlation functions should be used and you should really you know, make sure to use the pre-whitening technique and then you can really tell what uh, is going on with the lags. Um, I was able to do that with those, those fuel moisture sticks. In the case of the sample fuel moisture, 
I couldn't model it the same way. And obviously looking at some of those diurnal patterns, you can see the evidence of autoaggressive correlation. However, we also see evidence of differences in the species and they're very prominent for some variables. And so we must uh, say that there is something going on there. So um, some conclusions from the study were that there are critical differences in the fine, uh, fine dead fuel moisture dynamics for these two fuel types. And this is one of the most fire prone fuel, uh, fuels in the US. Um, we also saw differences in drying dynamics um, in, in this makes it really difficult to use the so-called traditional approaches to develop prescriptions. So in particular, if there's a big rain event and we have uh, a lot of pine litter, um, relying on those traditional approaches may be, may be um, difficult. So we can use the on-site weather con conditions to predict sort of the general dynamics of fuel moisture, but the differences in the fuel drying types are cautioned against the reliance entirely on these fuel moisture sensors. Um, also, we did see divergent responses in, in terms of responses to precipitation, to net radiation, to relative humidity, and they make it very difficult to parameterize fuel moisture effects and fire behavior models in the southeast. So our study suggests that there's a lot of variation in the fuel moisture content, and that's a, a critical component driving the patterns that we see. Um, and with that, I'll just acknowledge some of my, my co-authors. Um, the person who set up the study is Henry Goltz. Um, that was, of course, a long time ago. And um, hopefully some of my, my co-authors are in the audience in case I get a hard question. Thank you, Christy. Uh, we have time for questions. I encourage you to uh, unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Sure, Christina, this is David Weiss. Um, I guess my question is what, what, how many observations, well, I won't say War Eagle as I'm sitting here looking at the University of Alabama <laughs> website, but um, uh -huh. how, many, how many observations do you think you need uh, to apply these time series techniques to fuel moisture? That is a really good question. Uh, I, I mean, you really have to have I would say a hundred, you know, um, I, because I, because we we had that outage kind of in the middle of our our study, and um, I was a little nervous because I had to kind of break up those two ser series. Um, uh, you know, there there are all sorts of of uh, sort of I I don't know what to call them, sort of um, algorithms for computing how many observations you need. If you have a very strong series, sometimes you can get away with thirty. So I guess 30 is probably the absolute minimum, but, but yeah, you need a lot of data to do this. Um, so the half hourly data is of course great if you can get it. Um, but as we know, we, um, we didn't have uh, half hourly data on our field moisture samples. So yeah, I, I guess I, 100 is great, 30 is okay. <laughs> Good question though. Well, and has this been published yet? Yes, it has been um, in Ag and Forest Meteorology. It was um, published at the very end of 2019. But it's funny because we keep on, whenever I see my co-authors, we keep on talking about it because we, we feel like there's there's stuff there that we still didn't investigate th thoroughly enough. <laughs> so um, I, I think there's opportunity to, to do a little bit more on this. Um, and I know uh, Kevin Hires and his group at Tall Timbers have been doing some sort of similar kinds of data collection, if I'm not mistaken, um, to look at, at similar kinds of issues. Oh, thank you. Sure. Time for another question. Christy, I have a question. If there is a of like a 14 hour time lag for some particular fuel, does that mean that I have an enhanced ability to predict the, what, the, what the moisture of that fuel is going to be 14 hours from now based on what the micrometeorology says? Uh, I would, I, well, I'd use it the same as any other predictor. I mean, if, if the synchronous one, is it a good predictor? We could use, you know, the synchronous value, but yeah. So if you have a 14 hour lag, you should go and look at what was happening 14 hours ago to, 
to, and that will increase your model's ability to predict. And so in, in our case, we, we saw that there were some pretty significant lags. You know, if you look at the, the rain, the cumulative rain the day before, you have a better chance of predicting your pine litter fuel moisture, which is um, pretty cool, but also, you know, makes the system pretty, pretty complicated. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Christy. We're on to our last speaker, and I hope you will stay with us through the break here uh, for the grand finale. Um, last talk is by Scott Puckswinski of the Wildland Fire Sciences Lab of Tall Timbers Research Station uh, and Land Conservancy. So Scott, if you could go ahead and share your presentation, that'd be great. How about I unmute first? Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that introduction, Seth. Um, I appreciate being called the finale. Uh, and I also appreciate everyone who's sticking around through the break uh, to, to uh, watch a, uh, a um, presentation about fuel drying uh, and pine needle drying specifically, which is only possibly slightly more or less exciting than watching paint dry, um, depending on the color or what you're interested in, I guess. Uh, so I'm here to talk about a little bit about um, fine fuel moisture dynamics and some experiments that we've done out in the field, uh, specifically on pine straw, uh, some other things, but primarily this this uh, presentation will be about pine straw. So, um, you know, we're we, we, the previous presentations have talked a little about prediction um, and and how fuel moisture is important, uh, but we need to be able to pre predict, you know, f you know, fine fuel moisture, especially pine straw. You know, I think Christy mentioned that uh, in the southeast. These fine fuels are really what drive surface fuel fires. And so for fire danger anywhere, but also specifically in the really humid Southeast, um, these fine fuel moistures are what drive prescribed fire. And so as uh, someone who's interested in helping prescribed fire managers understand um, when and how and where to light, uh, this is kind of an important thing for us. So um, what we're going to do is look at different models that we've looked at or to sort of get at prescribed, I mean, uh, at fine fuel moisture. There we go. So um, first, the first model we're going to look at um, is uh, one of the most useful predictive tools that are in the literature, and that's um, equilibri equilibrium fuel moisture model. So the way the this works is um, equal, the equilibrium of fuel moisture is a function of uh, air temperature and relative humidity over time. So after, after a set amount of time uh, at a stable uh, temperature and relative humidity, you'll get that equilibrium um, of, drying, of drying. So what we wanted to do is look at all sorts of uh, different conditions out. We wanted to pull everything, all the fuel studies that we've seen in the lab and put them in situ and put them in real world conditions. So we looked at needle arrangements, um, whether they were laying flat, whether they're perched or vertical, um, and then uh, wanted to kind of simulate these real world conditions and, uh, and test, test the moisture or the, uh, and test, a, <laughs> and test our, all the models that we could, we could figure out, especially the equilibrium model, but then also look at um, implementing a process model for predicting fuel moisture under um, more diverse conditions. So um, this is, this is a, a long, uh, set of studies, a series of uh, seven experiments that um, that were set out in the field over uh, the last four or five years, um, in which we actually took individual bundles of needles, groups of needles, and um, painted the ends so that we make sure that we catch them if they uh, fall or go somewhere or you know get taken by birds or whatever, and then um, and then be able to weigh them repeatedly through uh, the day or for that period, every two to six hours, depending on what experiment it was. Uh, we had all sorts of different experimental treatments, um, some that were elevated, 
and somewhere that we're on the ground, as I mentioned, horizontal or vertical positions. Um, we also experimented with um, different substrates, different um, things to, to weigh. Uh, uh, typically, in every safe situation, we use long leaf needles, but also introduce dowels and short leaf pine needles in some of our experiments. But we'll be focusing on the on the long leaf needles. Uh, we also looked at age, age, needle age, um, because this was a long, you know, many experiments taken over a long period of time. It takes a lot of time to dip a fascicle of, uh, you know, 100 grams per um, treatment into paint. And then, um, and so we, we kept using some of them over and over again. So we also wanted to look at um, fuel over time, you know, over, you know, two year old uh, needles compared to fresh needles as well. The other thing that we also looked at was shading. So um, these were all placed out either um, either in open uh, on the on a lawn, um, and then some were actually in situ in forest conditions. And so, and we used, as you can see here, um, you can see A is an elevated flat pine bed, pine needle bed. B is actually uh, against the ground, and then C is um, is is has all of the needles. Um, suspended vertically. So um, they were all placed on galvanized steel mesh and weighed anywhere from 50 to 100 grams, depending on the experiment. And then they would be periodically weighed and um, in a in a in a enclosed weighing area at, as at at the uh, the periods that we we chose to weigh them. Um, we did uh, rounds one, two, six, and seven in the forest. Um, and then three, four, and five were sort of this uh, more controlled lawn uh, um, experiment where we had them all out on the beetle lawn out front so that we can really control um, shading. Uh, and so some of the results that we had early on were things like um, obviously suspended, suspended needles were drier, um, sunnier, uh, you know, uh, you know, sun sun was an important uh, aspect of drying, and then um, also older needles were uh, drying quicker than than fresh needles, probably with a cuticle um, that hadn't worn off. Uh, one of the uh, one of the treatments that we or one of the um, experiments that we're going to look at specifically in this case uh, is round four, um, where we actually had them out on the lawn. And we had three different treatments uh, and five um, five blocks random randomly placed, so complete randomized block design of these three treatments. Um, the ones that were laid on the ground, suspended on the platform, and then those that were vertical. And you can see that um, it was 11 day rainless sequence. Um, and you can see here uh, as we track through um, the moisture uh, per of the the kilograms of water per, per kilogram of dry fuel is what I've got up here. So um, you can see that as fuels dry during the day, the moisture converges really low down to less than a half a um, kilogram or around a half a kilogram. Uh, and, then, and then you get recovery um, through the night as RH goes up. So um, we got really high values at night um, and then treatments also differed by recover, recovery. So ground absorbed, um, absorbs and recovers more moisture later in the sequence versus um, the other two. Um, one second here. Um, and vertically oriented fuels had the highest recovery and later the lowest. So we were kind of wanted to look at why, was, why are you getting sort of this change over time? And then you can also see things like, um, you know, on November 10th, there was, there was a, uh, a lack of recovery. So, Let's take a look. So the first model that we wanted to look at was the equilibrium model. And that's shown in green here. We're, we're looking just specifically um, at the ground and the suspended um, treatments. Um, you can see that it doesn't predict the dry down entirely. Um, and part of that is, uh, it's been mentioned before in some of our previous, um, uh, the previous talks that, you know, these models don't work very well at 100% RH. And in the South, we get 100% RH um, sometimes during the day, sometimes during, um, you know, especially during recovery at night. Uh, and so they don't dry down properly in the model. So you don't actually catch some of these um, really low drops in, in fuel moisture. And then it also doesn't reach um, the values 
uh, the high moisture values of those on the ground later in the sequence. So we wanted to kind of think about what were the processes that were going on that you wouldn't necessarily pick up in the lab. Um, and so we decided to, um, when Seth joined us, he, he, uh, he helped us to come up with a process model idea. So the idea here would be that, um, you know, you look at things like um, total flux, uh, the, the great the sort of a gradient of moisture in the air um, and resistance of that fuel and where those, um, those um, gradients are coming from. So the moisture is estimated from your, your relative humidity, the air around you, um, duff that might be against you or not far from you um, and, and soil. And then also, so we can estimate those sort of things from, from fuel sticks in a raw station um, to kind of predict that energy balance. Uh, and then resistance can be estimated in, in these process models. I don't have a, an equation up here, but uh, resistance is an important thing that can be um, uh, estimated from you know, wind speed and distance from the ground or distance, yeah, distance, all sorts of distance from the ground. Um, so uh, these, so in the daytime, you know, the only, you're losing, uh, you're losing moisture from solar heating, and then at the nighttime, you're getting moisture from a couple places. One being um, from condensation from the air around you, but then also um, from the soil surface, uh, either conduction or or something like that. Um, so we uh, we decided to test sort of these. Um, well, this is still actually round four, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself. Uh, so our process, we, we applied that process model to round four, and we could see that um, that for that for the process model, and this is the process model for ground uh, in orange that you can see there. Um, and then also the moisture comparing that to the equilibrium model in green. So uh, it functions really well at 100% humidity, whereas the, uh, the um, uh, Equilibrium model does not. Uh, it also is much better at predicting that daily dry down, that lower dip. Um, and then also on uh, some days it did better on the recovery. Uh, so you can see on the 13th and the 16th that uh, that it did do a much better job predicting the ground, uh, the gr the the ground treatment. Um, but it when it comes to really crazy rapid. Uh, conditions changes, uh, it falls, kind of falls apart. So on November 10th, you can kind of see it didn't quite drop down to um, to the dry down that conditions that did every other time. And that, and, and we will get to that here in a second. So um, where was that recovered moisture coming from? So we were, uh, you know, Seth and I and Kevin uh, were having a lot of discussions about where are these, uh, you know, what are we getting, where's that, all that moisture coming from sort of not, you know, taking it again, taking it and putting it into a useful situation, trying to just figure out, okay, how do you model for some of these differences that we're having from these treatments? So uh, the ones you can see uh, the in this in this uh, muley grass with uh, pine needle um, photo here, you can see that there's some suspended uh, on the on the lower left. There's some suspended um, pine straw, and the, or the, actually that's on the ground. And on the ones in the upper right, uh, they're they're suspended. And so, you know, we kind of wanted to look at, well, where is that, is the moisture coming from condensation? Is it coming from moisture coming up from the ground? And our, our, the process model that we had um, executed so far had not given us any kind of uh, influence, or we, had, we couldn't really elicit any kind of influence from that. Uh, so we decided to design a, an experiment uh, for round seven to kind of look directly into that. Um, and our treatments included placing them again this time in the forest um, directly on the ground, um, putting down a tarp so that none of the soil moisture can have any effect on the drying on another set that was on the ground, but then also having one that was on the ground, but overnight we would shade, um, cover with, uh, with a frame with a tarp over it to prevent condensation from, from, um, from reaching it. So what we were able to find was that um, fine fuels that couldn't take up the moisture from the atmosphere overnight. So the, the covered ones are the black dots in, in line in this, in this um, chart. Uh, they recovered only half the moisture as the controls and gradually became more desiccated over the, the experiment. So you can see that sort of trend to more 
dry over time, um, but they did recover some moisture. So uh, the other thing that we were able to kind of see is that fine fuels that did not take up the moisture from the ground, so the blue were the ones that were laying on the tarp, dried down further than controls, um, but they also at the same rate recovered as the ones uh, that were um, on the ground. So um, looking back, if we go back to um, the round four, you know, what, is, what do these things tell us? You know, we haven't done some heavy analysis or run the process model on, on um, round seven, but how can we go back to round four and look and answer some of these questions that we have? So we know that based on round seven, that both atmosphere and soil moisture do recover or do contribute to recovery. Um, but um, in round seven, the atmosphere was a better uh, source of moisture than the ground. In both of those two cases where we didn't cover them, uh, they came up back at the same rate. Um, and so it must vary with the weather. So let's look at, you know, back at round four and see that um, absolute humidity, um, which is uh, in blue, yep, is blue. Uh, it rose steadily before week four, which is when, I'm sorry, before round four, which is around November 5th. Um, and then the vertical suspended fuels were able to harvest that much better overnight um, versus the, the ones that were laying flat. And then um, after the, you know, after the cool weather, we had some cool weather that came in on the, on the 10th and the ground after that point, the ground fuels harvested moisture more effectively um, from the ground. So um, that starting to kind of help us understand what the, what possible things were here. You can actually, I'll go back to this one, um, to that original, um, that original chart. And you can see, yeah, on the 10th that it, it didn't fully recover as well. Um, and that, that's kind of potentially explaining some of these mechanisms of, um, of recovery and drying down. So, so our conclusions uh, were that um, fine fuels, which we all know, and we've mentioned uh, in two of the previous talks that um, fine fuels are the workforce of prescribed burning in the Southeast, um, that fuel shading and orientation are important for dry down, but also recovery is, um, it's, it's a really important process that you know, is really driving some of these things. So uh, the weather, you know, weather also interacts very much with uh, fuel position and orientation. And so the idea would be that we could potentially use some of these physical process models to, um, in conjunction with uh, ROS, not, not, oh yeah, I'm trying to speed things up. Sorry to get to some questions here. Um, we can actually do that to predict, a, do a better job of estimating you know, using as long as we have uh, an early, um, an earlier section of ROS data, we can go back with some of that time lag information that Christina was talking about, but also using some of that stuff that feeds into the 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 um, the the process model, we can start to kind of be able to predict future um, future uh, pine straw or yeah, especially pine straw uh, drying. Um, I want to acknowledge real quick, um, in addition to the authors, um, some of the, some of our uh, field technicians that helped us out, Jacob, Sophia, and Iris, and um, any other uh, any other field technicians in the past that were unfortunate enough to have to go out periodically through um, you know every day for eleven days to uh, weigh fuel. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, we have time for a question or two, and I encourage you to unmute the mic and just go ahead and launch a question. As my uh, science teacher said, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Okay, then uh, I'm gonna wrap this session up. Thank you very much, Scott, appreciate it. And I wanted to let everybody know that um, uh, let me just pull up my announcement here.
Ah, yes. Uh, the session will be available in Whova, the conference app, within two weeks after Congress ends. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a break right now. We're heading right into the next uh, sessions, but I'd like to really thank everyone who has stayed throughout this session. And uh, there will be five general sessions now and one special session and two fire circle discussion sessions. So thanks again and enjoy the rest of the conference. Don't forget to attend the plenary. So long. Thank you.